to welcome you all to the 14th Tribeca Film Festival. Um, yeah, especially, I actually really want to give that a round of applause uh, because um, hmm. so Richard Holbrook, the subject of The Diplomat, or The Diplomat, um, was a good friend of mine and Bob, like he was probably a very close friend of a lot of you in this room. And 9-11 um, happened and we were trying to figure out what we could do for our community to make a difference because we weren't firefighters or firefighters or recovery workers and what could we do to give people a smile, a new memory. Um, and um, we proceeded to do the festival, uh, announce it, and put it on 120 days. And someplace along the line, I got really nervous about what we were doing. And how do you suddenly go from a city that's grieving to put on a film festival? And um, I knew that the world didn't need another film festival, but downtown New York did, and um, Tribeca did. So I called Richard and said, this is what we're doing. He knew about it. He's been, oh, he's been, he had been very helpful. And then we talked about who could come to the festival and help us change that sense of grieving downtown and going into the rebuilding phase, but who could help us start anew and say to the world, it's okay, let's go laugh, let's go to the movies, let's all collectively sit together and laugh or cry. And um, he called Nelson Mandela for us. And um, next thing I know, Nelson Mandela is at the film festival. Um, and so that uh, I owe him a debt of gratitude for that. Um, he also, someplace along the line during that first year, said, well, you know, I I'm available during those days that you're doing the festival. Uh, do you think I could be a juror? I said, sure, are you sure you want to do it? We have to watch a lot of movies. He said, absolutely, I want to do this. And he came and he was uh, a real, uh, you know, <laughs> he's a real movie fan. And then the film festival was over and he called me up and he said, uh, Janie, yeah, Janie, the fest festival is great, the festival is great. Uh, you know, but can't you get any better movies? Those movies were crap. <laughs> So, a movie that is not that, um, and uh, does show our ambassador um, in all of his uh, glory and get to know him even more, uh, is The Diplomat. And I'm very honored and privileged that um, David decided to make this film as hard as it was, but it's a real gift to our community and the world to get to know Richard that much better. So thank you and please welcome David. Wow. Thank you, Jane. I started working with you uh, around that time that the first festival started and, and I remember the motto was always look left. We come out, try back in, see what was happening there. And I remember my father complaining about those films. He felt that they were earnest, and that the jury went for the politically correct choice rather than the best film. <laughs> uh, but you, you've been such a, a help to my career, and you really jump started. And to have the film here with you and Bob and the rest of the Tribeca team, and of course Bob uh, made his own film about his father. And I think that's a really important story that all of us should tell. Of course, fathers, mothers, and I was really lucky to em embark on this. I was also really lucky to work with HBO. Richard Pleather has taken an interest in the film from the beginning. I've worked with Sheila Nevins and Nancy Abraham and the rest of that team there, and they knew I was making this film way before I did. So yeah, HBO, thank you so much. Uh, I have also amazing, uh, great executive producers, Louis Venezia, Scott Barry, Marshall Sonnenschein, and uh, Andrew and Barbara Gunlock. Andrew had such a force in this film and, and I really wouldn't have made it without his help so so thank you Andrew I think you're here I haven't seen you yet but uh, but I'm really grateful for you 
And of course, we had an amazing team working it, but the person who was truly and, and really indispensable was Stacy Reese. I just love her stand up. Stacy, stand up. Come on. Uh, and since this is a film about family to a large part, I just also want to thank her husband who stayed next to her letter. <laughs> it would give us a huge sacrifice for them. And thank you, Ross. And of course, my own family. They all were part of this. And you'll meet some of them in the film, you'll meet them after my brother, my uncle, my mother, and, and everybody else, but especially my kids and my wife, of Wiley, Bibi, Kitty, and Sarah could stand up. Thank you. This film was a labor of love, and I wouldn't have done it without your love. Thank you. I hope you guys like the film. Afterwards, we'll have uh, Roger Cohen, Ronan Farrow is here. Christiane Amanpour couldn't join us because she had interviewed David Cameron, the Prime Minister of England, which I thought was a lame excuse. <laughs> uh, but, and we'll have Katie Kirk moderating, Stacey and I'll be there, so enjoy The Diplomat, the world premiere. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for coming out for this incredibly touching film by David Holbrook tonight. My name's Mara, I'm the head of our panel's programming, and as part of our Tribeca Talks After the Movie, I'm so excited to introduce this panel tonight, and I'd like to begin by welcoming the one and only Katie Couric, our moderator for this evening. Okay, I think I'm just supposed to sit. Hi, everyone. <laughs> You want me to introduce everyone? Okay. David Holbrook, come on up. Stacey <laughs> Reese, Roger, Co Roger Cohen, and Roman Farrow. Anyway, hi everyone. It's great to be here. First of all, I just want to say I was so impressed with the extraordinary job you and Stacy did. Congratulations, David. I'm so proud of you. So in the way of background, so I sort of, David and I worked together on the Today Show. David was one of my producers. So at first when I saw him narrating the film, asking the questions, I was a little skeeved. I was like, what are you doing, David? <laughs> you don't belong there. You're not supposed to be doing this. But I have to, I told him earlier that after about five minutes, I thought, of course you're doing that. And you did a fantastic job. So really wonderful job. Um, so we have so much to talk about. I know there's some questions from the audience as well. But I'm curious, David, when did you decide to, to do this movie and why? I, I want to answer that question. I just want to acknowledge a couple of people in the audience who work in the film. Seth Bombs, our terrific editor. Graham Reynolds, our terrific composer. Julian, our AP, Amani, our AP, Emily, and Sarah, our co-producers. I'm missing a bunch of people. The other people I really want to thank were the people you saw on the screen. Um, my uncle, Kaji Martin, thank you for being a part of this film. My mother, my brother, all these other people. But I particularly want to thank some of the journalists who, who came besides this guy who, who really committed to coming to Sarajevo. Dexter Philbins, I know you're here. Where are you, Dexter? So, I, anyway, Dexter came to Afghanistan. George Packer, if you would stand up, I'd really appreciate it. I know you're here, George. Don't be shy. George Packer. George, George was working on a biography about my father. It was invaluable this and, and became a real partner. I said, George, the film wouldn't be anywhere it is without you. Read his book, 2016, 2017, it'll be great. But, but thank you all. And David Rode, I think you're here. Um, but, but I, and Frank Wisner, who was a colleague of my father's. I'm sure I missed other people, but I'm, I'm really grateful for that. When did I decide to make the film? It was really when I sat on stage and saw with all these luminaries and thought, wow, one of these is not like the other one. But I looked out and, and saw him as an historical figure for the, really for the first time. I, I also, the night before, there was a gathering of his staff and they all got together and they told stories of this man I didn't really know. It was very informal, it was fun and loose, but I thought, who is this guy? And, and I, I wanted to understand him better. You know, w when he, he died the, that night, we went back to his house in Georgetown. Samantha Power, who's in the film, said to me, David, you have to make this film. And I'm like, Samantha, <laughs> not ready. And, and then she came back at me at the Kennedy Center that day, a month later. And, and by that point, when I saw the, this array of luminaries, I thought, okay, I, I, I got to head out on this. 
you know, people ask me a lot, how long have you been making this film? I said, oh, about 49 years. <laughs> Probably cheaper than a therapist, right? But I mean, it's no, 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 not at all. Did you resent it all? Did you resent it all that all these people who work with your dad seem to? I, I was struck by the line in the film where you said, I wanted to get to know my dad more in death, I think, than you had gotten to know him in life. Uh, I didn't resent them, but I wanted to understand him better through them, and they really had access, and you see the wonderful informality of the pictures, especially with the SRAP group. You know, they were tilted in such windmills, it was so uphill for them that they had, I think they really bonded, and, and Vali Nasser told this wonderful story that wasn't in the film, that he said one day he came in around 7 p.m., checked in, he said, Richard, I have to take off, is there anything, and Vali, he said, Vali, sit with me, just help me with this, of course, which was, became more involved, and and he said, Richard, I'll be right back. I just need to call my wife, ask her to pick up the children. And when he came back, there was a note written out to his children, mm -hmm. dear children. They had knew their names, which was impressive. And he said, said uh, sorry that your father couldn't come pick you up, but thank you for help, letting him help me save the world. And it was just this lovely moment. And, and there were these pangs, but, but it, was, it was minor. And I was glad he was able you know, to build family in that way for him. And I, I want to get just everybody's brief reaction, because obviously we want to go deeper and talk, Ronan, about your experience working with him, and Roger, of course, about his foreign policy views, and, and Stacy, what it was like to make this movie. But, I, you, had, Ronan, you hadn't seen it until tonight, had you? Yeah, this was the first time. And, and how did, tell us what you thought. It's extraordinary. I, I miss him almost every day, and in selfish low points, I especially find myself saying... Well if, well, if Richard Hallberg were here, he wouldn't stand for this. He, he was, as David said, a, a father figure of the highest order to so many in his life, despite his deficiencies as a, as a father and to his family. And, and by the way, even to those he loved who worked around him, that group that you described that was so tightly knit, David, it, it was a nightmare for those on the inside, too. You know, he was tearing pages out of my hand, and screaming at me once to the, the point where his secretary burst into tears. This lovely southern woman, Donna, in those final years, said, I just don't know why he's being so mean. <laughs> but, and yet he would have taken a bullet for those people he cared about so much. So I, it brought back that rush of missing him and, and being profoundly grateful to you for paying tribute in this way. Because I hadn't processed my issues. So maybe it's not therapy for you, but it's definitely therapy for me. <laughs> <laughs> and Roger, what about you? As someone who's known him or knew him for, for the last 20 years of his life or more, um, how did you feel about it as, a, as, a, as a, an assessment of, of the man and his mission, if you will? Well, Katie, I thought it was is a terrific movie and a deeply moving movie and a, and a very... Um, accurate uh, portrait of Richard Holbrook. And I was, it was, you know, Christian mentioned the frustration of being in Bosnia and knowing what was happening, seeing Serbian shells being lobbed onto this city day after day, a European city surrounded by a dirt trench, pregnant women being blown up, and all these excuses being found for why it was impossible to do anything over, over many years, over more than three years, as 100,000 people died, and I was reminded watching the movie of how extraordinary it was that here suddenly was a man, a diplomat, a representative of the U.S. government, with an absolutely clear sense of moral purpose. He had been given a small wooden sculpture early in the war that was made by an inmate of one of the Serbian concentration camps. Not death camps, but concentration camps in Europe in the 90s, through which the Bosnian Muslims were being processed. And... Uh, he knew that something deeply, deeply offensive to everything that the United States stands for uh, was, was happening in Europe. And I think that drove him uh, from very early on. So I was reminded of that, and I was, I was moved by it. How frustrated do you think he was, though, that the Clinton administration was a little slow on the uptake, to say the least? And I thought you were actually, David, pretty kind about that. Madeleine Albright kind of mentioned that and then you sort of let it go. But how, how frustrated was your father that they weren't, there wasn't more action being taken in a, in a more expedient way? He was deeply frustrated, of course, because he, he saw so much more to be done. And he had a plan, as he says to my brother, you know, he really wanted to drive this forward. But it was 1995, it's, this, it's the year before a re-election year. It's all about the economy. 
stupid. It's, it's coming off what he called Vietnamalia syndrome, a combination of Vietnam, Vietnam and Somalia, you know, with Black Hawk down. So there was a real reticence to put American troops on European soil and have to grapple with what would happen if it goes wrong. So, but, but he knew, you know, I, think, I think one of the key phrases in the film is stroke outs, when he says it was diplomacy backed by force. And that was, that was the agenda, and I think that, that really worked. I love what Madeline said about you know, that he brought all this dynamism and all, but you know, he's a force multiplier. But he was incredibly frustrated. Poor Katya had to live with him then. It must have been impossible. You know, and on their wedding day, he's calling in in 1995, he's calling the White House saying, you have to bomb them, bomb them to hell on, on their, their wedding day because he felt it was such a slow run-up to action. And, and I feel for the president. He had domestic advisors in the White House saying, this isn't such a good idea. And who I think some of them secretly, or maybe even openly, wanted Dayton to fail. I mean, that's... Yeah, that it wasn't going to be a good thing if we had to be committed in that way. Well, nobody thought it was possible at that point, I don't think. When this began in 95, nobody really believed that, that the war could be ended. And I think one of the important phrases in the film is, is, is a Begovich saying this was not a just peace. And it wasn't a just peace in many ways because the Serbs, in some senses, were rewarded for their aggression. They got half the country. But not another shot was fired in anger after Dayton. 100,000 lives have been lost and not another one after that. Diplomacy does not deal in perfection. And Richard Holbrook <laughs> understood that absolutely. It was a question of what is our national interest and what is each side prepared to give in order to find a compromise. And diplomacy is tough, and the toughest diplomacy is with enemies. And we've Seen that again with Secretary Kerry, who's just spent eight days in Lausanne. And I think Richard Holbrook would have been very proud of Secretary Kerry devoting that amount of time to an issue as important as trying to make a nuclear deal with Iran. And diplomacy, as I said at the end of the movie, uh, I thought at one point that it was just dead. Um, I think there is something of a revival of it now. And, and Stacy, you probably got to know Richard Holbrook. Uh, did you know him prior to making this movie? I, I met him as David's dad. I actually sat I think, behind him at the screening of David's last film at Tribeca, but that was about you know all I knew of him. I didn't know that I was going to become the therapist and a part of the Holbrook family, but I'm <laughs> deeply grateful for that experience. Um, um, but I didn't know him, um, and that's what I was drawn to. I mean, the idea when David said, you know, can you come have a coffee with me? I want to make this film about my father. And I said, I'm in. And he said, I haven't told you anything about it. And I said, well, I'm in. Um, you know, I was really interested in his work, but I was really interested in the universal story of a, of a child trying to understand their parent. And I think that everyone can relate to that, whether you're interested in foreign policy or not. Now, were you amazed at how much rich source material there was from which to draw? Because, I mean, thank God your dad wrote those letters to your mom, David. Thank goodness that we'll talk about the tape recorder in a minute. Um, but, you know, clearly there were so many things. Was it hard to winnow it down? And, uh, I mean, and really just get through the sheer volume of material and then, you know, synthesize it. Um, I don't think that we realized quite how much archival material was out there despite those file cabinets. So I do, you know, remember reading through those letters that... Um, David's father wrote to his mother and feeling like a real, you know, part of this family and calling David up and, you know, saying this is incredible and that he had been saved all of these letters and how that art of letter writing is sort of dead for future historians, I, you know, with emails. and but, um, but that and then just going through all that archival material and, um, you know, seeing that scene, it always gets me of him being named the ambassador to the UN and he gets choked up. Um, you know, finding those moments, even though his father was a public figure and, you know, a lot of his life was lived in front of cameras. I was going to say, he did still, a lot of interviews. Exactly. <laughs> but it was finding those moments in the interviews. I mean, I think he was on Charlie Rose 52 times. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so... He holds the record. Somebody can go after it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. And he hosted for Charlie when Charlie had, had a heart thing. He yeah. signed it. He um, and and were you all surprised about let's let's talk about those tape recordings and and with the Bob Woodward tape recordings and then his personal 
tape recordings. Roger, were you aware that he had made those or he was talking to Bob? No, I wasn't aware, and, and the movie <laughs> has indeed broken news, and it was reported today in, in my newspaper. So, uh, but I'm not surprised in the sense that I think Richard Holbrook always had a very profound sense of history and of his eventual place in history. And uh, he'd written a very good book on Bosnia, and I'm sure he would have written a great book on Afghanistan and Pakistan had he lived longer. So the fact that he was uh, recording what was happening and recording his frustrations, uh, I don't find that particularly surprising. I do think that it is really a... I understand why the Obama administration felt uneasy about Richard Holbrook. He, uh, he was a man of a different generation, a different style. Uh, he, had been, um, he had been with Hillary and not with with the president uh, in the fight for the Democratic nomination. There were lots of reasons, but uh, the way that he was just, with all the experience he had, just kind of hung out to dry. And after that, George Packer's piece uh, on Richard Holbrook appeared in the New Yorker quite early in the administration. You know, they just decided this guy's too big for us. And uh, I think the United States thereby lost an opportunity, maybe, to do more and do more earlier. And let's face it, the surge in Afghanistan led to a loss of American lives uh, to no political purpose. Richard Holbrooke was right. His experience of Vietnam was exactly right. If you don't match the military force to the eventual political objective, that is to say, an agreement and we can get out of here, then it's just a public show of something. And Young American men and women go out, and some are grievously injured, and some are killed, and not a whole lot is achieved. So uh, I feel it's deeply regrettable that he wasn't listened to more by this administration. Maybe it was his, his very association with <coughs> Vietnam that freaked the Obama administration yeah. out a little bit. Of course, and you hear him saying those tapes that Hillary told me not to mention Vietnam. If you look at that speech we use in Act One, where what does Vietnam mean? He's making that an event for the history of Vietnam for the State Department, specifically. I mean, Kissinger was there, other people were there. And he says, what does it all mean? And, and what he's really talking about is Afghanistan, I think. He worked really hard on that speech, but the same lessons apply. And, and you know, for him, that was always going to fall in deaf ears. Right? I have to say, the recordings didn't surprise me, because he seemed preoccupied in those last days with memorializing himself almost. It was as if he knew the end was coming, and certainly medically there was some basis for that. You know, he, he was controlled in what he was telling people, but there had been scares, there had been trips canceled, and I think even the passing of, of memos outside of the system, he wanted there to be copies of those retained. He wanted it all to be preserved. And I remember there, there was a, an incident, the details of which are still sensitive, compartmentalized information that I can't even get into, but as the guy liaising with human rights groups, I was getting fed horrific videos of things going on on the ground involving our troops, Pakistani troops, that kept me up at night and were very troubling to me. It made me question whether I should be in the system. And the parallels to what he had gone through in Vietnam were striking, and I actually took a step not unlike what he did and you know, was writing memos about things and, and hassling him all the time. And he would say, oh, talk to Samantha, talk to Samantha. You know, he, was, he was so spread thin by the end. But when I started sounding the alarm about certain things, we had this shouting match towards the end where uh, he started on this speech of, you think that you have a destiny, you think you're bigger than the system, you think that, that you belong at the top of the line all the time, and you know, even when you, you know, everyone questions you, you know history is going to remember what you stood Just for. Like and I realized midway through this, it was a, a, truly a horrible fight that we had actually, you're talking about yourself. <laughs> this is not about me anymore. And, and, I, and he did arc to that place of, they're not listening to me, but history's going to remember. Mm. And I think you've done a, a service to his desire for that. He wrote, you know, he, was, he wrote one time, he said, I was 24 years old working in the White House, and I thought I knew right. more about Vietnam than anybody in the administration. That was above him. There might have been, you know, Tony Lake, or one of his peers would know right. as much. And, and he really had that confidence that he had seen it, he had seen it up close. And I think Roger hits on a really key point in the film, that idea of he couldn't go to pretend to know anything about Bosnia without being that. 
you know, for him that was essential to be on the ground and really see what was going on. And, and I think the third act, when he gets to Afghanistan, he had made several trips there as a private citizen. He had been writing about it and all of that. Then he gets there as a government official, and everything's changed. Because the filters that are up between him and the truth, arguably, are, are really tricky to get to. Where before he could go talk to journalists, he could go to refugee camps, he could go to all these places where he could get the answers he needed. Now the embassy was arranging a schedule, and there were rivalries there, and it became really frustrating for him to be able to get real answers. And if you look at his staff, I mean, Rina Mary is Afghan born, and he had, he had people who understood their way around that country, but he was frustrated, for sure. And it, I thought it was so interesting and such an appropriate bookend to start with Vietnam and end in Afghanistan, because they, the two situations did, in terms of his foreign policy uh, philosophy and his, his worldview, really kind of mirror each other, didn't they? Yes, yeah, it's, it's certainly. Uh, yeah, I think I think one of the big themes of the film is really this this question of who makes diplomacy in this country. Is it the diplomats or the generals? If you look at Vietnam, there's this muddle. And then again, that key phrase that Strobe Talbot says, diplomacy backed by force. But he also had a, didn't you think there was a, a, an innate conflict between politics and diplomacy? We were talking about it earlier, but with the Tom Donlin kind of saying that he was going to write up the strategy and he he knew that that was basically just politics at work. I mean, I feel like there was a lot of tension between not just the military, but between sort of the political minds in the White House every step of the way, and not just in the Obama administration necessarily. Yeah, well, President Obama was with, withdrawing from Iraq, and he needed to show at the same time that he was not just about withdrawals, that he was not weak, at least that's my analysis of it, and, and so there was, there was pressure to show that in, in, in Afghanistan he was going to redouble uh, the effort. I think that was, a, that was pr pressure put on him by the military, though, don't you think? If Obama had had his way, I think he would have agreed with your dad, don't you? I, Possibly. I, yeah. Um, I, I think they weren't, Ronan would know this better than me, but I think they weren't that par, far apart philosophically. Same with Doug Lee. He was an obstacle. He was, you know, considered an enemy for what is worth within these rivalries. But Doug and him weren't that far apart from what they thought needed to be done. It was just it got, as as Doug says, it got too personal. By the way, you're very kind to Doug Lude in the film, but it has been publicly reported. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> well. Compared to the reality, some of you, you, you follow the trench. I think you, you hand him a spade and allow him to dig. I think it's, uh, but he was to give you a sense of frame of reference. Why do you want to sing from the White House saying, you know, we need to get rid of this guy? This is you, you've seen all of those communications, some of which have been made public. Sure, and you really wanted him gone. You, know, you had Doug Lute, you had General Jones, you had Dennis McDonough, who's kind of big in the White House these days. You know, all of these people were gunning. To him, yeah, and I remember what, the last time I saw my father upright um, was at dinner in, in October of 2010. We went to, to Georgetown for for dinner, and, and the Woodward book had just come out. And then there was a lot of talk. General Jones was saying, you know, "Holbrook's a dead man walking." And I asked my father, and I said, "What's the deal? You know, what's up with General Jones? Tell me." And and he said, "I'll tell you this." He goes, "You know, I may not last through the, the full term." He said, "But I'll be in this administration longer than General Jones." That Friday, General Jones tendered his resignation. You know, and, and it's classic. You know, there's always been, you know, elbows, sharp elbows, and rivalries between state and NSC, and all these things. I just think it got worse here. And I think you know, the the toxic primary campaign made it harder. There are a bunch of things that made it more difficult. And and why do you think he was so insistent on staying in the game? You know, uh, he just. He was being marginalized. It was a humiliating experience, obviously, for him. Nobody was listening to him. I think Hillary Clinton had to be sort of the go-between, right, between the administration and your dad. Um, but yet he just, he just, he, he couldn't leave. But, but there's one thing worse for him than being in the game, and that was not being in <laughs> I think or he losing had... the game, right? Yeah, just not, I mean, he, he wanted to shape policy, and he knew... You know, he had a vision, he had experience, he had all these things that I think he felt if, if anything was going to solve this intractable situation, it was going to be something that you know, he, 
he was going to devise. And, and I do think he had a plan that was, you know, Ronan could speak to it better, but the idea of a grand bargain. Like, well, yeah. the irony is that is exactly what's on the table right now. Mm -hmm. President Ghani is contemplating exactly the same kinds of talks. It is the same set of, of concerns about reconciliation talks that are in play right now. And he was putting them on the table much, much sooner, and the administration just wasn't there yet. But having said that, it, I mean, I'm curious, do you think it really is a good idea to negotiate with the Taliban even today? Look, I think there are very valid concerns. We have, you know, Rina Amiri would tell you we have a constitutional jirga looming where the even the progressive streak that now exists in the Afghan constitution protecting women's rights could be obliterated if there's not enough That's female true. representation in those conversations. It is teetering on the brink of backsliding. <laughs> Certainly many of the achievements that Holbrook prized in his time in that job have already slid back. Uh, it's not a pretty picture and it never is. And one of the things that I'm struck by watching this film is something that I thought about him in life. He just refused to believe in the concept of the impossible. And through happenstance or convenience or the dazzling willpower that he had, life aligned in a way that reinforced that belief on his part. Nothing is impossible. And, and Dayton just fueled that. And he really thought that Afghanistan, even the, the graveyard of the empire for all the ages, was something that he could fix. No one else but him. And, and to his last day of December 10th, you know, he was meeting with David Axelrod. He's meeting with him to try and see the president, to get 15 minutes. And there was a great line from Tom Donilon who had to come, but he said he felt if he could just build that room, get in the room, and, and and, but he was never able to get there. And, and, and I don't think, from, from other reports, that it, it went well with Axelrod. I don't think he heard what he wanted to hear, and that was that. I think just that chemistry, uh, you were talking about a generational thing, but also it was just sort of maybe his style was off-putting to them, right? I think it was, and, and Roger mentioned the George Packer piece, which was this brilliant 18 page. I couldn't believe how long it was, even though it was on my own father. Like, when is this? Where are the cartoons? <laughs> it was in the New Yorker. It was in the New Yorker. It was just like, but seriously, even for the New Yorker, it was really long. And, and, <laughs> but it fascinated. You know, George is a brilliant writer, and I thought he really captured these complexities of what he had to deal with. But as George can tell you, you know, my father got really... But it wasn't yeah. the content of the article that troubled the administration. It was, it was, it was, the, was the length. length. It was the length. It was the length. And that in itself uh, was telling. And I think, uh, I think Richard always had his eye on one thing. It was that there would ultimately, if this was ever to end, have to be a negotiation with the Taliban. And he was the guy who could conduct that negotiation and bring it to a conclusion that wouldn't, like any negotiation, allow either side to get everything it wanted, but would be an effective compromise. And I think one word we haven't used yet tonight, I don't think, is, is patriot. Uh, Richard Holbrook was an American patriot to the very core of his being. And he believed in the beneficence of American power. He believed, it's an unfashionable idea after Iraq and Afghanistan, but he believed, and he demonstrated it in Bosnia, that American power could be should be, must be, a force for good in the world, a force that allows, as President Clinton said, uh, children to have lives they wouldn't otherwise have, and it allows the spread of um, freedom and democracy. But just as importantly, Ronan, maybe you can speak to, to, to this. I, I was struck by his acknowledgment early on, as early as Vietnam, of the limitations of American power. So he really understood that balance, didn't he? He had this remarkable combination of the quixotic and the utterly pragmatic. I mean, he understood the limitations, particularly, I would say, of American military power from those profound experiences that he had in Vietnam. And what he was running aground of what were fundamental systematic problems, that the balance of military resources and civilian resources in the government wasn't something any one man is going to change. That's the arc of American history. But he wanted it changed, and he was sounding the alarm, and they weren't listening. I know we have a lot of smart people in the audience, so should we take some audience questions, you guys? Or uh, maybe while they're getting organized, I just wanted to ask uh, about the very moving moment in the film where... Uh, you're talk, uh, where you're talking with his staffer. What is his name again? Yeah, Feldman. Yeah. He's, he's, by the way, is the current astronaut. He's, oh, he's, really? Yeah, there was there were several, but he was... He, is he was so astronaut. great. And thank goodness he wrote all those things on that Chinese restaurant uh, Amazing, right? receipt, because um, I hope you, ha you have that. Did he give he, that he, to you? He has that. He held it on for the history. 
joking. No, I'm joking. I don't know what. <laughs> I was like, you need to get that. No, and, I, and I have a copy of it. And, and you know, I, I think again for the staff, it was searing. You know, it was it was such a painful and, and difficult time for them in, in so many ways, and and for all of us. And and those few days where he was he was dying, you know, I was there. My wife was there. Kati was there. Her kids were there. It was. It was here, and Chris John came. At the times, it was like a National Security Council meeting. Yeah. Yeah. There was Hillary, Tom Donilon, uh, General Admiral Mullen, you know, one person after another that were, you know, and, and you could tell. But, but when, we, when he died and we came out, the staff was keeping vigil. The first person I saw was then Senator Kerry. You know, it was this, this gathering, and, and uh, it was an incredible time, and I, and I think for his staff, you know, they, they were living with him. And, and, and one of his, his key people told me, she said, David, I can't work here anymore. It's like all the energy's left the building. And, and there are a couple people, including Dan, who has his old job, and, and other people, but I think they really believe in carrying on this tradition. You see that last dedication to you know, the next generation of diplomats, and Hillary was gracious about that, and, and I think that was so important to him. And George wrote a ton about that, was all these people who, inspired and, and believed in it was it was essential to him. The end felt so surreal those last yeah. days and as you say, bringing people to the hospital, everyone paying tribute and, and many people with a guilty conscience paying tribute too late. And you really hear that in President Obama's eulogizing him. Mm -hmm. uh, that the remarks of that funeral are extraordinary for all the people who loved him like Les Gell, but also for the people who said, Mea culpa, we didn't listen to the lessons of the past. Mm -hmm. And he was the, the human embodiment of that. And I remember that last night, just the, the surreal setup of we had left the hospital to go, Hillary and Cheryl Mills and the staff, to go to, there was a tribute to music theater at the State Department in the, in the diplomatic chambers and in the Ben Franklin room on, on top of the State Department. And then that's when we got the word that he was flying and they were, he was going to be unplugged. And I guess you were at the hospital and we all came back and it was freezing cold and terrible storm, storm raving. And I, uh, I went over with Rosemary Pauley, his longtime chief of staff, and then we all stood there as he went. And the remarkable thing was that Hillary Clinton just went into leadership mode that she night. She was amazing. She pulled everyone together, and we went over to, I think it was the Ritz Carlton bar, and uh, Steve Ratner's wife, Maureen, opened a tab, and Hillary just held forth, and people shared stories, and people cried, and we were there into the wee hours, and it really did feel like family, but on this world stage of war and national security issues with so much hanging in the balance. Let's take some questions from the audience. Kati, thank you very much for being here, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a very odd feeling to hear my husband talked about as a historic figure. Um, and of course, David, this was a painful experience for me to watch this film. So much uh, of my 17 years with your father came rushing back, but I want to thank you for making it. It's, uh, it's an important film, and uh, I genuinely hope that you feel that you have a better understanding yeah. of your father sure. and, and, uh, and of his uh, historic role. Uh, I, I just want to... Um, the question was raised as to why he stayed when uh, when so many of his friends advised him to leave. The reason that he stayed was that he genuinely believed, and he was the greatest optimist in the world, that the administration would have no choice in the end but to come to him to negotiate. because. Quite simply, no one else could do what Richard Holbrook could do. He had this deep well of self-confidence. And Ronan and I beg to disagree. Richard did not think he was dying. The, the morning of uh, the day he left us, the day he lost consciousness, we were on the telephone laughing and making our Christmas plans. I could say a million other things, but I just want to say, looking around this wonderful full house, that Richard's 
enduring genius was connecting to people. He was the most connective person any of us will ever know. And for 17 years, we had a perfect record of never missing a day of talking. And one of my regrets, really, is that when he called me from the ambulance, and it was the only call he made and the last call he made, and I heard this very strange voice tell me that I feel something that I've never felt before, and that voice was full of panic, that at that point I just shouted into the phone, I'm on my way, and now, and then rushed to be by his side, by which time it was too late, he had lost consciousness never to regain it, and now, of course, I regret that I didn't take a minute or two longer to tell him uh, what, what an amazing man he was and what an amazing life we had and, uh, and the unconditional love that he gave me um, will, will never leave me. So thank you for making this film. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm a child of Bosnia. I was born there, so I just wanted to say uh, we really appreciate everything that your father did for the country. Um, that's really it. Uh, we really appreciate I wouldn't be here today, and many uh, other be Bosnian people wouldn't be here today if, if it wasn't for him and his team. And yeah, so that's it. Well, well, thank you for that. I want to... <laughs> One thing to really help you achieve with this film, that line at the end, this is a tenuous piece. We were there, and Roger knows well, it's a tenuous piece, and it's lasted, it's been effective, but Dayton was meant as a transitional document. It wasn't meant as a constitution, which is what it's become, and I really hope that this film will air on HBO in, uh, in November, which is great, because that will be the 20th anniversary of the Dayton Peace Accords. And as Roger wrote recently, you know, that's the most significant foreign policy achievement of the last 20 years. If Iran comes together, perhaps that might equal it. But I really hope this film turns some attention to it. It's been really easy to forget. Because, hey, done, good, let's move on to the next crisis. And that's not how it should be. And particularly with Clinton's. You know, this is his greatest foreign policy legacy. I hope that she's able to turn some attention. And, and we'll see. We're screening the film in Sarajevo Film Festival this summer. Tell your friends. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, why don't you stand? Just um, thank you very much for the film. Uh, I would like to know personally, um, how did you encounter those tapes that your father recorded? Uh, was it difficult to expose something that you knew was going to be controversial and kind of antagonizing with the Obama administration? And also today, um, uh, General Petros have. Uh, declared himself guilty of the charges, so it's kind of that... Uh, Ironic, huh? Ironic, exactly. <laughs> He's the fallen hero that was uh, in rivalry with your father, while well, today your father is the hero. And uh, would you elaborate on that relationship and uh, um, how he became to have that relationship with the military, or that skepticism of well, the military? There are a lot military. of questions there. Um, <laughs> so so the, the tapes gave because uh, George Packer, they were in the archives, and George was very gracious to share them with him, with me. There's a ton of other material that's fascinating, and again, read his book. Um, it, it's, you know, we really need those tapes, because what we had was in the first act, Vietnam, we had these letters to my mother in his own voice, and they're beautiful. In the second act, we his journal, his book, plus, he's so alive, and so vital. And the third act, we had great people like Ronan and all these other people talking about him, but we were missing his voice. And when we saw his voice, he'd say, Afghanistan is a long, hard slog. There, you know, he just had, he didn't have that dynamism that Madeline talks about. So we kept on saying, we got to figure this out. And I knew he had talked to Woodward. And he, which he didn't tell people. You know, his best friends, Frank Wisner, you're here. He didn't tell you about that, right? And, and he didn't tell Les Gelb about that. And, 
And they thought, oh, wow. He, when they found out, they're like, wow, he really may have been losing his mind at that point. Because if they had talked to you, never would have let him talk to Woodward. <laughs> and and as, it, as these guys told me, Woodward screwed him in the book. He made him look ineffectual, and it was unfortunate, despite all those hours. But I got Bob, I convinced Bob to do this, and then the, which was very gracious of him. Um, and then these tips came along, and, and I think it changed the entire third act of the film and, and gave it a rawness, and again, his voice. And it's, it's haunting. And you know, one, one of the reasons I wanted to make this film was I felt he had more to say. It was just that simple. I thought he, he died too soon, and he had more to say. And he did. We were right. And, and the tapes were so powerful on, on that front. And, and I think just take the film to a whole nother level. As for General Petraeus, I wish him luck. He was very gracious to do an interview. And it was before his troubles. It was, yeah, it was. Uh, I don't remember no, the exact time. He, 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 he had been. I, I he want was, to say one thing yeah, about please. the tapes. Because we were one week from finishing an eight month edit, and the film was finished. And I remember, and we were just like making fun. I mean, Seth, our editor, can talk to speak to this also. like very close to having this finished film to you know show to HBO. And and then Bob Woodward calls David back and basically was like, come to Washington on this day and this is my address. And like David wasn't even trying to wrote the address down right. I mean it was, was like, like you can look it up. Come street. And we <laughs> have been trying to reach him for months and months and months and, and he's like, I'm the easiest person to reach in Washington. So here we are, a week from finishing the film and we are on this train to Bob Woodward's house in DC no idea what we were going to find, if he was going to do an interview, and, um, you Remember know. also we had this thing scheduled, then Ben Bradley died. Oh, right. So then and we, we knew that was going to, you know, set, set, put a wrench on that. But, but that we're was, so uh, happy that we have this material because yeah. we feel like it really, um, it really changed the film. But I do remember as a, the producer feeling like, what? We're keeping the edit open longer? I mean, of course, I'm so happy we did now, but... Um. But, of course, that one sentence that yes. says they, about the Obama administration, they don't have a deep understanding of the issues themselves, but increasingly they're deluding themselves into thinking they do. Mm. Ouch. <laughs> what do you think of that? I think it's pretty frank. Do you think it's accurate? <laughs> um, yeah. Really? Well, I think that, look... Um, I found one of the most moving lines in, in, in the movie was the reference to Moby, Moby Dick and, and the faraway Barbara Shore. You know, there was something romantic about Richard Holbrook. He, he wanted to go to those faraway shores, and he didn't believe, as I think no good journalist should believe, and there was a lot of the journalists in Richard Holbrook, that you can understand anything without putting your boots on the ground. And that can be dangerous, that can be difficult, and it's usually expensive. Uh, but he, uh, I mean, why is he saying that? Because he's been there how many times by that point, and he's reached certain conclusions. And he doesn't think that, again, it does go back to Vietnam, he doesn't think that the administration has, has understood the full consequences or nuances of the situation. David, what do you think after listening to all the material, drove him to make those tapes. I mean, I, I still, I, I think very much in those last days, probably over the course of his life, he was preoccupied with memorializing with history. We talked about it a lot. But whether he knew the end of the job was near, and certainly the impression I got was when he got calls from the White House in those final weeks, he was panicked about it. And whether he knew, you know, his health was flagging, I take Kachi's point that he was vibrant and, and in full sail even at the end, why was he putting it all down? What was he trying to achieve? I, I think it was a pretty simple reason is he wanted to write a memoir. Well, he actually wanted to write his two volumes. <laughs> um, but but he, had, he had talked to his literary agent. He had talked to his speaking agent. He saw an exit ramp, and I think it was in the summer of 2011. And he thought, okay, I'm going to get out of here, and, and I want to be able to keep this fresh. And, and he says in the tapes, we don't use it, that Mort Janklow, his literary agent, told him to do this, and he was right. And I think it was also an outlet for him, because you guys, to a T, every single person said to me, and this is, goes back to Roger's important point about being a patriot, every single person I talked to said he never spoke ill of the president. Right, Conti? He never did. He never said anything ill. He never said anything to me, to my brother, to his staff. And if somebody criticized the president, he'd cut them off. That was not allowed. 
I think this was a, a, a valve for him, an outlet where he could say, hey, this is what I'm really... And by the way, it's worth noting for context, he was not a person who hesitated to speak ill in general. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about what would your dad think of the film, and I said he probably would say there wasn't enough me in it. <laughs> and I say that lovingly. But, you know, we're, we're pretty much out of time. But in closing, David, since this really was, uh, I think, a, a journey for you, saying that you really wanted to know your father, I expected at the end for you to tell us what you had learned about your father and your impressions of him and your views of him as a man, a father, and a patriot. So why don't you close with that? Uh, he was a remarkable man. He was. And, and when we were with him, my brother will speak to this, it was so exciting. I mean, it really was full of energy. And, and, you know, Samantha's great line, there's nobody is alive, it's Richard Holbrook. And I, I think that was right. You know, he was spread so thin. He told me once he had a supercharged life. I think that was right. He had this life that was trying to work on so many different cylinders, and his brain was so crazy alive, you know. And, and I seriously, there were times I thought like he'd been cloned because he was doing so much. Dave, have you seen Big Love or an HBO? Like, hey, I just read this book, and I'm going to the theater, and I'm doing this. And, and that, that energy was so palpable. And... and you know, but, but what I think I, I really took away was how hard it is to do this job of diplomacy. How committed you have to be, how, how you have to see the playing field in so many three-dimensional ways. And he was able to do that. The thing that, that breaks my heart really at the end is how hard it was for him in that third act. It was hard in every act. Right. But the third act, though, was unnecessarily yeah. hard. That's the thing that, that gets me. And that a patriot, a man who believed in public service deeply, wasn't able to carry that out, and, and you know he was, a, you know, he, he was a realist in that, that sense, but but it was unnecessary, and that's the part that always kind of gets into wow, what an uphill battle, and and yet he was going to keep at it, he was going to keep at it, he was going to keep at it, and and you know that, that persistence making this film wasn't always easy. A lot of people didn't believe in it, didn't believe I was the right person to direct it, all these things, and. Whenever things were tricky, when we weren't getting emails back from whoever we were trying to interview, whatever it was, I was like, yeah, this really sucks, but not nearly as much. <laughs> I was having to say, the White House hate you. You know, somebody said all this film, they said, boy, I hope your taxes are in order because <laughs> you may have some issues. I was like, oh, okay. Should also leave it on a, on a human note because I think for all your dad's sort of larger than life persona, he could suck the oxygen out of a room and he did have a sizable ego. I think, you know, he was really a study in contrast because I think he was an incredibly caring person who really was so selfless in so many ways. So he was, he was. Complex, don't you think? Totally. It was, and you know, the, the Times had a nice quote today in the paper about, you know, we did consider calling the film undiplomatic. <laughs> you know, and, and that's just a contrast. You know, the Washingtonian magazine in the 70s wrote at one point that Richard Holbrook defies the rule that all diplomats have to be impeccably dressed. <laughs> you know, he was that poor cop. He was always trying to, to make shape up. Shape up. And, and look, you know, he, he was this. The, you know, I mean, Roger, we had the crazy, the, the way he eats, the way, you know, he was... But at such a breathtaking moment, when he's talking about his father and he breaks down, I find that moment so breathtaking and so telling in, in many That's ways. Right. Uh, you know, the theme of fathers and sons in all of this, it was, it was smart of you and it's moving that you included that as something that's in the forefront and in front of the camera in the film. And I think it works beautifully and, you know, obviously it resonates with me. He was the closest thing to a father I ever had in a lot of ways. And I just keep thinking how much better life would be, selfishly even. Diane talks all the time about how she would call him before every big interview. Life would be better, not just for me, but for the country, if he were still around. Well, that's it was a, nice a loss, for sure.